So, and then a bunch more things. Um, and then on the far, you should see chat in there. Does everybody see the chat button? Okay. Yes. I want you to avoid the chat button because it, it, it pulls me out and I, I get, so then my attention deficit really goes wild and we're running down rabbit holes. Um, if you want to communicate about something on the far right is reactions. And if you click reactions, raise hand comes up. And, and what'll happen is I'll see this little yellow hand. Actually, I'll raise my own hand and maybe you can see it. Can you see the little yellow hand? Uh -huh. That'll happen on your screen. And that'll clue me in that I need to pause. If I miss that, um, unmute yourself and go, hey, you're ignoring me or something. Okay. So I am going to, you don't have to mute yourself right now, but I will ask most of the time you're muted because we all have dogs, we all have traffic, the doorbell rings, the phone rings, those kind of things. Um, let's see what else. Does anybody have a Zoom question? Everybody's on. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jamie, wave, Jamie. Jamie is actually not a member of this class. She is our Emory helper, our Emory facilitator. So if we start having technical problems, she'll be jumping in to help. If you personally are having a technical problem, we'll, you can reach out to her. And that is the one time you would use the chat. Um, reach out to her in the chat and she will chat back and forth. Worst case scenario, she may have you call her or something like that. Oops. All right. Is that everything I think? All right, we're going to get started then. Raise your hand if you've taken this before. If we what? I'm sorry. If you've taken this class before. Okay, no. <laughs> Cherie, Judy, Carol. Oh, so we got some newbies. Awesome. Awesome. And we got some return people. I have some people that take it over and over and over again, um, which is always kind of fun because you see something different in every book. Poor Carol took a class with me um, this summer, and I'm going to tell you right now why we chose this book. So the last two times I taught this class, I did a marketing thing to start, and the class picked the book based on some marketing elements. They were both horrible books. One of them ended up being so wildly inappropriate that it was hard to talk about. And the other one was just boring. So I changed that and I just picked one this time. <laughs> um, I also picked science fiction because I don't normally read science fiction and I've never studied a science fiction book. So it was a whole new world. Anyway, okay. My name is June Converse. Um, the, the, the class is being recorded. That probably came up for you guys because you have to approve that. Um, I, um, I don't know how you get it if you want to see it, but I guess you can contact Stephanie. So I'm June Converse. I am a born and raised Atlanta, which is unusual. Uh, I was a high school teacher. That's my main, main past. I taught high school for 12 years. Um, I have since written two novels and I'm working on my third. Okay. So you're going to get both that. And I'm an avid, like Renee, I'm an avid reader. I read about four books a week. Um, one nonfiction and three fiction about every week. So I'm a really rabid reader. Um, so I also have always have too much prepared, I'm always over planning because I used to teach high school. And those of you that know about high school teaching, if you don't have every minute planned, they're going to take control, right? Um, so just bear with me on that. If we don't get to something, we will get to it next time. Okay. I wanted to tell you why there's no syllabus because People at Emory suggested we have a syllabus, and that's because I have no idea what we're going to do next week. And the reason I don't know what we're going to do next week is I haven't read the book yet. I let the book guide the class. So if, if next week this guy did a great job on Ordinary World, but did a terrible job on um, crossing the threshold, that's what we're going to talk about. 
if I notice he's doing a great um, word crafting, I'm going to talk about that. So I'm going to bring up what's working in the book, what isn't working in the book. Um, and that's why there's no syllabus, because I have no idea. So every class kind of gets rewritten after I read the book. Let's see what else. Um, you know how to contact me through the Emory. You all got an email from me, so you should be able to send me another email. Um, after the class, I will upload the slides so you have them. Okay. I, the only thing I ask that you do is don't share them with anybody. Okay. Uh, I mean, your, your significant other, but don't copy them and hand them out. Okay. Um, they're a lot of work. Um, you're investing your time in this class. So, so let's just do that. All right. So one other thing for you to know is I don't randomly call on people um, because we're adults. And we may or may not want to contribute. Now, in high school, you know, you have to. Um, so I'll just kind of leave that out there for you guys to know. I don't randomly call on people. Um, my sources for this class are impossible to give you because there's hundreds of them. Okay. Uh, so just know that it comes from lots and lots of study. Would any of you people that have taken it before, so Cherie, Carol, Judy, want to jump in and make a comment about this class? Cherie will, I can tell. <clears throat> well, I love your style and your format. And even though we've read this, you know, gone through the similar format each time, I learn new things every single time. And I think the best side benefits I can say about your class, June, is you have helped me to read more books, Good. to read faster, which I really wanted to be able to read faster. And it's just setting that goal and, and hearing somebody else like yourself saying you're reading four books per week. I've always listed the books I read, but this class really helps me to read more. And also it helps me to identify all the writer's style mm -hmm. and the things that jump out at me that before I felt like I wasn't even really noticing. Mm -hmm. So it's just a win-win, and I'm a great reader, book club person, and a wannabe writer. So for me, it hits a lot of the buttons that I just love. So okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. Have you noticed applying the concept to <coughs> the screen just moved? Have you noticed applying the concept to movies? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm going to use an example today that came to me last night watching TV. The Great British Baking Show follows this model to the minute. And that is the Great British Baking Show. You wouldn't think it would, it would have three act structure, but it does. So thank you, Sheree. Sure. All right. I'm gonna just get started and we'll get to know each other as we go. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. So I'm gonna share my screen. Bear with me here while I get my PowerPoint up and running. I got to figure out how to make it. There we go. Okay. So today's class, hopefully you haven't started to read it yet. If you have, shame on you. If you had already read it before now, that's okay. Um, I think that's happened a few times in classes and you're still going to be fine. You will be rereading it. Um, it's going to work out to be only about 50 pages a week that you're having to read. So, um, which is really manageable. I've done some books where we're having to read too much, uh, like, um, Jim in Moscow. That was, that was a lot to have to read, but it was so good. It was so good. Um, to Cherie's point, Cherie, I'm going to be presenting something totally different this time. I'm going to be adding save the cat. So you'll get something totally different this time. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the, I already, let me explain why this book, I kind of preempted it. Um, I've never done science fiction. It was getting wildly rave reviews. And then a friend of mine who also doesn't read science fiction called me and said it was one of her favorite books. So I was like, okay, I've got to try this book. I've got to try science fiction. So that's why this book. Now, one of the things I want you to notice about this book is what color is it? It's yellow. 
I want you to start noticing when you're at a bookstore or even walk looking through Amazon, how many books that are new, new books have yellow in the cover. There's a big study that came out that all the authors read and got on the bandwagon that the color yellow pulls the eye in and, is, is, and it gets more sales. So you're gonna see more and more yellow in covers, which I thought was really interesting. So that's what the marketing part of the author's job is. Okay, is to think about stuff like that. Okay. So, all right. Somebody tell me and just raise your hand so I can see why you're here. Sheree already talked to me. Why is why are you here? So this is where it's hard not being in a classroom because I can't feel who wants to talk. Does anybody want to share why they're here? Yes, Carol, go ahead. I guess I'm mute, yeah. Yeah. I'm here because I loved your class this summer and I've been wanting to take another one. And it was just, you tell so many interesting things about writing, which I never thought about writing being so complicated <laughs> <laughs> and taking so long. So, so I really have enjoyed the class. I learned all, I like all the things I learned. Thank you. Um, Amar Tolls spent um, 14 years writing um, Jim in Moscow to give you an idea um, of how long a book can take, especially a book that has such li literary quality. You know, the, the mainstream um, upmark the upmarket paper books don't take as long. The reason I teach this class or how this class came to be so I finished teaching high school. I owned my own high school. I closed it down when my daughter graduated because I couldn't pour energy into other people's kids as easily. And I started hiking up and down Stone Mountain. And while hiking, I was always listening to music. This character just kept talking to me to the point where I felt a little like I was kind of coming apart at the scene. Like there was something not quite right for me. And so finally, I just went home and wrote it. And it was 300 pages. I decided to make it a book, never thought about publishing a book, um, sent it out into the world pretty much without any help other than commas and stuff like that. And then a second book came to mind because that story wasn't finished or there was a part, another part to the story. So I decided I'm gonna learn what I'm doing, okay? And so I started studying and I read book after book, I took class after class. And at some point I finally sat back and go, okay, is this what's really on the page? Now this crap I'm learning, is it really in a book? So I pulled down a book, I just, and it happened to be a David Baldacci book. I just reached for it and grabbed it. And I studied it the same way we're, way we're gonna study this book. And it was dead on to the page number of what was supposed to be where it is. That was fascinating. So then I pulled down a more literary book to the page number. Everything was where it was supposed to be. I've, I've, I think this is my 17th class. I've not had one book yet that didn't do what it was supposed to do. So that's where this class came from. Okay. Uh, Colin, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just saying that I wanted to take the class because I am a retired English teacher myself and uh, I like the structure and the composition of the books as much as the story of involved in book clubs I've been involved in. It's all about the stories and the characters, which is great. And mm -hmm. I, I, I like that aspect too. Uh, but I'm as interested in the craft of the novel as I am in the, in the actual story that comes out, I guess. You are going to like this class. Um, what grades, grades did you teach? Uh, I started off teaching 10th <laughs> grade and then I was, uh, I found my, niche in uh, middle school, actually, seventh and eighth grade. Um, uh, and, and I like that because they were just becoming aware mm -hmm. that people actually crafted stuff and it wasn't just like random words people wrote down, whatever came off the top of their head. So uh, I liked having those epiphany moments almost every day in class where somebody, some kid realized, oh, they meant to do that. <laughs> well, I hope you have some of those this time. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Debbie, what about you? Well, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I went through all the list of classes and kept picking out one and then another and then another. And then when I just read the title, I was really intrigued and I looked up the book to see what it was about. 
and I generally don't ever read science fiction or, but the, the thing about this is it sort of reminded me of the movie, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Just the whole memory changing and wiping out and starting back. So I was really intrigued and I was reading um, the, oh, the anomaly, which was, I, it was recommended in the New York Times and Washington Post. And I got, a, I finally found, you know, was able to buy a copy. So I was reading that, which is science fiction more so than anything I've ever read. So I was really intrigued. And I thought of all the classes, this was, <clears throat> spoke to me more. It was not a, a just a it was just really interesting to me and I was excited about doing that. And I didn't teach anywhere. I studied sociology, which I guess can be science fiction sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was really intrigued and very excited. And I got the book of the library and then found it Eagle Eye, a used copy that I was able to buy. So I will, you know, have it forever and um, can share it with people if they'd like. So I'm excited about, stepping outside my comfort zone or my normal reading. So, yeah. I think what you'll find and um, is you won't be able to give this book to anybody because you'll have written all in it. Um, okay. Yeah, so they, there's books all over my shelf. I can't give to anybody because there's notes everywhere. And it really oh, well, this is a little paperback. So um, I used paperback I got from them because I got it from the library, but I can't keep it through, you know, I can't renew it through the whole can't keep it for 10 weeks or whatever. No, no, I can't. I, I ask. And if, if nobody else wants it, then I can keep renewing it. But yeah. I, uh, well, no, I found this. So it's not a, you know, no, it's not an issue. What about you, Ron? Well, many, many years ago, um, last century, actually, <laughs> when I was a senior in high school, I took a, a class in my senior, well, when I was a senior, uh, we had to read a novel a week, and they were generally uh, current novels or, or bestsellers or classics, and we had to write a paper, and every Friday morning we went over them. It was expository, and uh, I really enjoyed it, so much so that I went off to college thinking I was going to be an English major. I was quickly disabused of that idea and uh, wound up in engineering and um, haven't read anything in the way of fiction or even science fiction in many years, and so... When I saw this title, I thought, hey, this is a good way maybe to get back into it. I really enjoyed it at one time. And, you know, I, I want to find out what I'm missing and, and how to read them. So uh, it was a it was kind of a no-brainer for me. Awesome. What I think you'll find is we're taking the engineer's approach of looking at a novel. We're going to look at all the pieces that make it work. Um, and we're going to look at the pieces that make it work and where they're supposed to be. And if they're not there, how we as readers feel that. Uh, you, you just get a, it's that this book went, this book took too long to get started. It's the one that it ended too fast or it just started to drag in the middle. That's because in an engineering mind, those pieces weren't exactly where they were supposed to be. Um, so what about you, Wayne? I know you're new to Zoom. I'm so glad you made it. Yeah, I was a Zoom holdout, um, old school, I guess. But I have a uh, background in, in English. I was an American studies major in college and ended up teaching freshman English mm. for about five years, college English, which uh, was a, uh, a distinct challenge, to say the least. But anyway, I, I ended up switching careers because I was not willing to go through to get a Ph.D., but um, I'm not a voracious reader, but I am, I've always been interested in literature. And I thought this course would be a different way of looking at literature. Yeah, it will um, be. It's a departure for me. I've never taken a course like this before, but um, I'm curious. When I saw it with science fiction, you almost lost me though, because I have little to no interest in science fiction. I almost said, no, nope, not doing it. And then I thought, well, it's not really the book that matters so much in this class. It's more about the architecture or how it's put together. So I stuck with you. Yeah. And, um, and you and I are in the same boat. If you were to look at my shelves, which you can't really see, this is the only science fiction. 
So you and I are in the same boat. Um, I will tell you though, Wayne, um, in the summer we read, and Carol was in that class. Um, it was a, it wasn't um, at Emory, and it was a really bad book, but we got a lot out of it anyway. Um, it was almost as much fun to talk about why it wasn't working, you know. Um, so, so just hold tight. If you don't like the book, keep going because it'll be interesting yeah. to talk about why. Oh, one Thanks. more thing. I got a stupendous recommendation on your class from, <clears throat> from Jackie Walker, oh. who, has, who has taken your class more than one time, several times. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, Jack, Jackie and I met when we did the Ollie trip to Cuba. Ah. And, uh, and I trust her. So, um, so, so now we'll, I'm here we'll for the see. ride. All right. All right. I'm going to, um, Renee, I'll get back to you in just a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just want to, um, so what we're doing is we're peeking behind the curtain. All right. Well, you, the consumer, see the finished product. Um, that is a long road for the author. Um, and an author wears many, many hats, and we'll talk about those, okay? Um, I'm going to skip some of this because we'll come back to it. I want to be sure we get to the, as I said, I always over plan. Um, what I want, I'm going to, I want you to think about why you read, okay? You could watch TV. You could listen to music. You could knit. You could do a thousand other things. You could become a baker. Why do you read? And Renee, before you tell me what you were going to tell me, tell me why you read. Um, well, listening all the comments, there are a couple of things. Uh, I will start with why, why do you read? Um, but before I said that, uh, I was uh, sort of uh, impressed by the number of people that are in the world of letters and um, books, et cetera, et cetera, teachers, et cetera. Uh, I come from a completely different world. Um, uh, I am a medical doctor. And uh, what, I, what I was just thinking, why do I read? Because even in my worst possible times, I always found a few minutes to read something that was not medicine. <laughs> uh, my father was a reader. He was a voracious reader. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if it is you know, genetics. I don't know if it is um, nurture. Uh, I don't know if it is seeing my father reading all the time. But I, I like to read. I enjoy reading. But listening to you, uh, I guess I am a slow reader. There is no way I can read four weeks, uh, four books a week. But kind of um, this is my job too. So, so uh, please, please teach us how to read uh, fast. I I took a course in speed reading. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much it helped yeah, me. I don't. Yeah. Um, I uh, I guess just in my own way, I do two kind of readings. If I have to read a book for a book club. I, I do a very slow reading, understanding everything. If I'm just reading for myself to, to, to read something, to learn something, I guess I, I read, a, 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 I do a faster reading. Um, the word that gave me in the course, because when I read, uh, when I, when I read um, science fiction, I said, oh, this is not for me because I don't read science, science fiction. But then they says we're gonna dissect. Okay. Oh, that that touch. Uh, oh, because, I bet it did. Uh, yeah, I come from the world of yeah, dissection, you know. So yeah, I pulled yeah. you in with that one word. Yeah. Speaking so, of that, I want you guys to do me a favor, and you're gonna hate it. Heads up, you're gonna hate this activity. I want you to send me your favorite fictional book. Now, do not stress about that. This is not supposed to be take five hours and pull it apart and oh my gosh, I'm really, which is which, just pick one and send it to me. Because next week we're gonna look at first lines in books and how they can have a lot of power. Um, and I wanna be, I wanna use your favorite books first lines. And so I'll go out and, and pull the book out um, and get the first line. So if you have a chance, send me what you think is your favorite fictional book, okay? 
Uh, mine might be gentlemen in Moscow, but if you ask me in an hour, it might be Pride and Prejudice. Just pick one. Don't stress, okay? Um, and no one will see it. So if you put Fifty Shades of Grey, nobody will know it but me, okay? Um, and that's okay. I love it when people say they never read it. And I'm like, well, 18 billion people did. So I don't know who. All right. So here's why people read according to the research. Pleasure, of course, escape to reserve something private for themselves. So it's, the, it's a relationship you build that's only yours, um, which I thought was interesting. To transport us to places we've never been. To live vicariously with someone who's more interesting than us which I thought was interesting too, to investigate universal truths. And we're going to touch on that one today. To see ourselves, and this is my favorite, and this is one of the reasons I like to read, is to watch others behave in a way I cannot. Okay? I love the character who says something that I could never get away with. And I, I love that because then I get to watch how it would have gone for me had I said that thing I really wanted to say. But society wouldn't let me. Um, develop empathy for other points of view. If you read Jodi Picoult, um, if you've ever read her, that is her big, big thing. Every book she's ever read, written, is about shades of gray. Do you agree, Linda? You're shaking your head. Okay. So that's kind of her, her niche. Okay. Um, to abate loneliness. Um, I'll give you a quick story. I went skydiving once, and only once. I was scared out of my mind. And as the plane is going up, I started thinking about a couple of my favorite books. And I actually started imagining what those characters would tell me sitting there. So I went to fictional people instead of the people on the plane um, for calm. Love, we love language. So some of us are really big into language and love the imagery that's created. Schadenfreude. Does anybody know what that means? Delighting in the misery of others. That is where books, the best books are getting to watch or listen to the mis, uh, misery of others, which makes us sound terrible. I'm going to read from this book right here. It's called Wired for Story. It's by Lara, um, Lisa Crone. Um, fictional narratives supply us with a mental catalog of fatal conundrums we might face someday and the outcomes of strategies we could deploy in them. What are the options if I were to suspect that my uncle killed my father, took his position and married my mother? That's Hamlet, of course. If my hapless older brother got no respect in the family, are there circumstances that might lead him to betray me? What's the worst that could happen if I were seduced by a client while my wife and daughter were away for the weekend? What's the worst that could happen if I had an affair to spice up my boring life as the wife of a country doctor? How can I avoid a suicidal confrontation with raiders who want my land today without looking for the coward and thereby ceding it to them tomorrow? There are answers to be found in any bookstore or any video store. The cliche that life imitates art is true because the function of most kinds of art is for life to imitate us. Well, that was a pretty good reason. All right. We read to know there's, ooh, it's hard for me to read with you. There is, we read to know there's someone tracing a life very much like our own, or not at all alike, but recognizable all the same and making it a moment worth sharing. So those are the best books. Okay, the ones that we go, what if it was me? Okay, which is really where Jody Picoult is outstanding. All right, I liked books, the respite and privacy of them. Whenever I sank into them, I felt free. Why do writers write? It's not to make money. 90, 75%, and later I'll give you the statistics of authors make no money. Many make negative money, okay? And we'll go through some of those statistics later in this course, but it's not to make money. It's because there's a story in them that demands to be told, okay? Stephen King, if you ever read On Writing, if you haven't read On Writing, whether you like Stephen King or not is irrelevant. It's an extremely good book. Half of it is his biography 
And the second half is how he writes as far as craft goes. Um, and we'll be using him a lot. Sometimes it's a character that they come up with. And that's what happened to me. I had this character that came up. Sometimes it's a plot that's exciting, okay? Sometimes it's an idea. If you ever read David Baldacci, and he's a super mainstream formulaic writer, but he wrote a book where the, the man has synesthesia and hyperkinesia or something like that. And I guarantee you, David Baldacci read about that in some science magazine and went off and wrote a book about it because it was an idea he thought was interesting. Um, I think this book we're reading now is gonna be that, an idea that is interesting. Maybe it's an internal struggle that needs to be worked out. If you haven't read all the ugly and wonderful things, first of all, don't read it. it it's, it's got some disturbing elements in it, um, but you can tell she was working out her own crap, okay? Um, Maybe it's an external struggle, this dealing with what's going on in the world stuff. Um, 1984 would be that kind of book, okay? But in the end, there's a story that demands to be told. I know a lot of writers who will say, I didn't write because I wanted to write. I, a matter of fact, I hate writing, but I can't get the story out of my head. So they write. So I want to make sure you understand what we're doing. We're going to understand plot, all right? Plot is what's happening outside the character, okay? So plot right now is you sitting wherever you're sitting, drinking whatever you're drinking. That's plot, okay? We're going to look at the three-act structure. We're going to look at the hero's journey, and we're going to look at save the cat. Which these will make sense as we go. We're going to look at whether some, we're going to look at the formula versus being formulaic. And two different things, okay? We're gonna understand what story is. Story is not plot. Story is, what are you thinking right now? What are you feeling right now? What is the internal real reason you're sitting in this class? Okay, that's story. That is, what baggage did you bring to this class? Are you irritable because you got in a fight with your spouse this morning? That's your story. Okay, we're going to talk about more of that as we go. Um, we're going to try to wear all five hats of the author. All right, we're going to look at scene structure, character development, pace, stakes, word choice. We're going to look at all of that as we go. All right, we're going to look at what they say and we're going to see if he does. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Okay, all right. We're gonna study at the foot of a master. Now, whether you like this or don't like this, the fact is this man was able to produce a 312 page book that made the New York Times bestseller list. In comparison to me, that makes him a master. Okay, he knew how to do something right. Okay, all right. There is artistry to words on the page, all right? Uh, and we're gonna talk about that as we stumble across that artistry. If you read The Gentleman in Moscow, that had more lyrical writing than any book I've ever read. Um, I, I actually might want to teach it again. It was so rich and beautiful. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, I'm going to look at different techniques the author's using, like polysyndetons and asyndetons and zugmas and parallelism. And there's, I think, 900 different ways. And we're going to look at as many of those as I happen to catch. Okay, so let me give you an example of what I mean by that, because I want you to go away knowing so you can start watching for stuff, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So there's three repeats. Stop, stop, stop. No, no, no. That's called an epizuxis, okay? And it's a piece of craft. It's an intentional thing the author is doing to bring attention to that, to give pace to that, to give emphasis to that, okay? The other one is this one. Tears and sniffling and a fracture apology. Okay, that's two things. It's a polysyndetin, meaning and 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 with no commas. Okay, so instead of tears, comma, sniffling, comma, and a fracture apology, that's a polysyndetin. It's also a zugma, which I want you to see if we see any. A zugma is this. If you hear tears and sniffling, I think the third word would be not a fractured apology. 
Okay. So I read another one where the woman opens her purse and she says, I found my lipstick, my hairbrush, and you expect the next thing to be wallet, right? And she says, and a lot of regret. That's a zugma. It's when the third thing in a series doesn't fit the rest of the series. Okay. So we're going to be looking at stuff like that, which um, Colin, I think you'll find particularly interesting. And who was the literature professor in his other life? Hmm. I don't remember, but you'll find that interesting as well. Okay. The Zugma is very rare. Very rare. I think I've seen it twice. All right. All right. Not only do we crave story, but we have very specific hardwired expectations for every story we read, even though, and here's the kicker, chances are next to nil, the average reader could tell you what those expectations are. By the end of this class, you will know what those expectations are. And you will notice when they're not there, you will be frustrated, which is what happened in the class in the summer. They just weren't there. All right. So when I say the author wears five hats, I mean it. Okay. And having been an author with two books out there, I mean it. The first one is the writer. The story's got to get on the page. Okay. Um, the number of drafts we do is, is very dependent. Um, Hemingway did 66. Stephen King almost always does four. Okay. Um, I also have to be the character, right? Because the character, if they're any good, is a three-dimensional, four-dimensional person. That means I have to be that character. I have to step into how they feel and what they want and what they're afraid of. Um, I have to pay attention to when another character does something, what does the other, what, if character A does something, how does character B feel about that? Um, I got to be in their thoughts. I got to be in their body language, right? If the shoulders go up, it's because my shoulders went up. Okay. I have to be the editor. Um, now, Stephen King, of course, has an editor. James Patterson has an editor. Nora Roberts has an editor. The rest of us, if we get picked up by a publisher, they will edit it. But if you turn to them crap, they're not going to read it. Does that make sense? So if you don't do enough front end editing to make it a clean manuscript, no one's going to read it. Okay. If you're going to self publish it, you better pay for an editor. Have you ever read a self published book and you can tell it hasn't been edited? I had one just last week said, you're going to hell, H-A-L-E. Uh, who spells hell? Okay, that kind of thing. So they have to be the editor. And we might play with that. If I see errors in the book, I will um, pull them to your attention and we'll look at where editing did not work. They have to be the publisher. All right. Any new author, unless it's picked up by a big boy, the smaller houses, you have to do a lot of your own publishing work. For example, you have to choose your own cover. You have to choose the interior, okay? That's a lot of work goes into choosing the interior of a book. How big is the font going to be? What is going to be the scene break? Where do I want to start the chapter? Do I want to start it on the left or the right-hand side of the page? Do I want the chapter to you know, be start at the halfway mark and have a big letter to start? Do I want the letter to be cursive? All of that has to be decided. Then the author has to market the book, okay? Um, we have to talk about it. We have to, you have to be on social media. You have to be on social media. Um, and you're never, ever, ever gonna get your book sold, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? You might have any questions about that. So in this next eight weeks, you're gonna be wearing all eight hats plus the reader. Okay, that's what we're all five hats plus the reader. So six hats. You're going to be playing and looking at all the different things. Um, we're going to talk about how we marketed it. Um, this the, the hardest thing to write, and I tell you, it worked, is this back cover flap thing. Okay, um, because it's it's got to do so much. Okay, all right. When a story enthralls us, 
We are inside of it, feeling what, I'm sorry, I can't see it, feeling what the protagonist feels, experiencing it as if we were, as if it indeed were happening to us. And the last thing we're focusing on is the mechanics of the thing. So in a good book, you're just going along for the ride, right? In a good movie, right? You're, you're glued to it. You're not paying attention to whether the inciting incident happened we're going to pay attention to the mechanics of it. I'm sorry, I'm getting drawn out. Emotional contact with the reader is the only strategy for success. Okay. I want you to think about that favorite book. <coughs> and I want you to think about, did it make you feel something? Whether that was fear for the character, love of the character, dread, um, did it invoke any emotion at all? So somebody let me know, answer that for me. <coughs> Who's willing to answer that? Well, Wayne has his hand raised. Oh, Wayne? I don't know if you meant, and you've had your hand raised for a while. Did you mean to keep it raised? Yes, because I'm too stupid to know how to, you know, to get rid of it. <laughs> You go back to the same thing and it'll come up and say, stop the raise. I, I just tried to do it earlier and it stayed there. So anyway, well, don't worry about um, it. but certainly um, I don't remember exactly what your question was, but the emotional connection is, is gotta be a huge component. Um, if you're going to keep the reader, you know, engaged. Yep. And um, so what do you want to repeat the question? That was the question. Did you have an emotional engagement? You have to. Oh, definitely. Oh, no, no doubt about it. To yeah. me, the better, the better the book, the more emotional engagement I have. Exactly. And I'll tell you as a writer, that's the hardest thing to write. Plot is easy. You know, plot is the car hit, you know, the car slammed in the back of the other car. That's easy. It's right. the emotional impact of what does the person feel? when the car smacks, right? And so like, you think that sounds easy, but it doesn't. If it, I, I smacked somebody in the rear end one time when I was 15 and driving illegally. That's a very different emotional experience than if I hit somebody now, right? I can afford it, you know, as long as I didn't hurt anybody, we move on. Um, that's when the emotional writing comes in. It's very, very hard to do. So as we're reading, I want you to notice when you feel emotional. When is the author doing it right? Um, Renee, you're muted. You're muted. Ren Renee, you're muted. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to say is uh, obviously you like the gentleman in Moscow. Um, the, the plot of that book took about 32 years. I know. He wrote another book that I, I like it very much, The Lincoln Highway. Mm -hmm. I've got it on my shelf. Um, the, whole, the whole story, the whole plot takes only 10 days. Mm -hmm. So that was my first reaction. I said, gosh, he, he wrote a book in 32 years that takes 32 years to develop. And now he's gonna do the book in 10 days. So the intensity, you know, he put me in that mood. And then when you start reading, yes, it is very intense because things happen very quickly. And you, you get emotionally with, with the characters because they move very fast. They do a lot of things in a very short time. So yeah. I, that's the way I understand your question, yeah. my emotional yeah. reaction to, yeah. the, to the book and to the author. That's, and, and that's something he strives for. Um, and all good authors do, right? What about you, Colin? You have your hand up. Uh, I was going to say that my favorite books tend to be ones told from multiple perspectives. You mentioned Jody Pico later. She does that quite a lot in her books. Uh, and so seeing different characters react to the same situation and seeing how each one handles it, those tend to be the books that draw me in. Uh, so not necessarily my own emotional reaction, but understanding the emotional reaction of others too, I think. So I want you to help me with something at the end on the eighth week. 
because they say you can only have one protagonist, that you can only have one. So at the end of this book, I want us to debate that because I know there are two points of view in this book. I've read enough to know that. I've read the first like 10 pages, mm -hmm. um, mainly because I wanted to make sure it wasn't, you know, sex, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I want us to debate that because they say you can't have more than one protagonist. But let's just think about Pride and Prejudice. We have Darcy and Elizabeth. So who's the protagonist? Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Because I'm with you. I like the multiple, multiple points of view. Okay. Um, whether the character cries is not as important as whether you do. Cognitive psychology and neuroscience, this is actually from a bunch of neuroscientists, um, has proven there is an implicit framework that must underlie a story in order for that passion, that fire, to ignite the reader's brain. There is a formula. Okay. Um, where's the question? Let me see what this says real quick. I keep having to put on my glasses because I can't see you with them on. I can't see the writing with it all. A st um, stories are about how we, rather than the world, changes. The stories grab us only when they allow us to experience how it feels to navigate the plot. Okay? The we have to feel in order to want to navigate the plot. Okay? And again, we'll talk more as we go. These are the big six that we need to be able to answer at the end. This is what drives your um, query letter. A query letter is the letter you send to an agent or a publisher saying, please read my first chapter or my first 10 pages. You gotta know who it's about. What does this character want, desire, and need? Want it might be different from desire and they're usually different from need. Why is this important? What's at stake? It's a big one. If nothing is at stake, we have no reason to go on the ride. What happens if he fails? Because if we don't have this sense of urgency that, oh my God, this tragedy is going to happen if he fails, we're not going to be locked into the book. Who's, the, who's in the way? The antagonist. What about the character might cause him to fail? Okay, those are the things the author needs to be able to tell you and then quickly, or they really don't know what their story is, okay? So when I work with writing students, I start with character development because they gotta know their character, but if they can't answer these, what, six things, we keep working until they can, because they don't know what story they're telling. Without these six things, you don't know what story you're telling. And that's okay as a beginning writer, all right? Plot. Plot is, as I said, the external. It's what happens to the protagonist, okay? It's the wild ride the character endures to get what they want, right? Um, James Bond, right? Lots of plot, lots of plot, okay? Um, the plot is decided by the author, okay? Meaning I can take my story and put it in um, medieval times. I can take my story and I can put it in the future. I can take my story and put it on a spaceship. That's the author's choice. Okay, where do I want my character to experience this story? Okay. Story is what's going on inside the character. A good author lets the character guide that decision. Okay. I'll give you an example. So my first book has a, a gentleman in it. He's, he's 52-ish, pretty, pretty, pretty successful, right? Um, very type A person. He's got the corner office, that kind of thing. And he has a fight with his sister. And I show that fight, that scene to my husband. I said, how do you feel about that? My husband said, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's how my a fight with my sister would go. I'm literally sitting in the tub that night and my character stands next to the tub and goes, I am not your husband. That is not what I would do. 
I would tell my sister to get the F out of my office and you need to get up and write it the next morning. That's letting the character guide the story. And when I rewrote it the next morning, he was right. Okay. Many authors do this before they go to bed. Matt, Kathleen, whatever the names of the characters are, please tell me where we're going tomorrow. And they let the, and they let the character take the keyboard. Okay. As soon as the character takes the keyboard, it flows. Okay. Um, another way to know you're emotionally writing as an author is when it gets hard for you. If it's not getting hard for you, it's not getting hard for the reader. By hard, I mean emotionally hard. It's hard to sit there. Okay. All right. So that's story versus plot. And we're going to look at both because they come hand to hand. Um, but the plot is driven by the author, the characters driven by the, the stories driven by the characters in a good book. The author needs to know this. What must my protagonist have to confront internally in order to solve the external problem I've put together? Okay, that's what we're gonna be looking at. I'm watching for hands to go up. Story leads to theme. I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but we, I wanna get some groundwork. Theme is the take home. What is this, what do we want you to take home? Jody Picol very clearly wants you to take home um, the idea of shades of gray and to get you to think about whatever her, her topic was. She really deals with really good social issues, okay? Um, authors ask themselves, what is that I want my reader to be thinking about? What point does my story make? How can I change the reader, right? Those are the things an author is asking themselves. Um, I do want you to know it's not usually clear when an author starts writing. It becomes clear. Usually authors have too many things they want to do. You know, they want to do a justice theme and a love theme. You know, they want to do find the bad guy, but I also want the detective to fall in love, or I want the detective to have trouble at home. Well, which is your thing? Okay. I'm gonna read what Stephen King writes about it. If you write a novel, spend weeks and then months catching it word by word, you owe it to both the book and to yourself to lean back or take a long walk when you finished and ask yourself why you bothered, why you spent all that time, why it seemed so important. In other words, what's it all about? When you write a book, you spend day after day scanning and identifying the trees, when you're done, you have to step back and look at the forest. Not every book has to be loaded with symbolism, irony, or musical language, but, you, but it seems to me that every book, at least every one worth reading, is about something. Your job during or just after the first draft is to decide what that something is. Your job in the second draft is to make that something clear. This may necess necessitate big changes and revisions, the benefits to you and your reader will be a clearer focus and a unified story, and it never fails. That's theme. What is the story about? The story, not the plot. How many of you watched some of the James Bond movies? Okay. So those of you that haven't, you know who James Bond is, you get the idea. So until Skyfall, he was, that thing was all plot. Skyfall was mostly story in that a lot of that movie was trying to understand how, why James Bond operated the way he did. We got a lot of his past. We got to step into the home he was raised in and see how cold it was. We got, so that was story. So all of a sudden James Bond turned into story. And since then they've been a mix. Um, so just so you know, if you watch James Bond, it's something to watch about. Okay. There are, and I'm not kidding you, I have all these books, many, many ways to plot your story. Okay. There's a three act structure, which is, we'll talk about. There's the hero's journey method, there's the snowflake method, the 27 point method, the nine point method, the story implement, story engineering method, the save the cat method, and so on and so on. But the trick to those is 
they all follow the three act structure. Okay, and I'm gonna show you what I mean. This is Aristotle's three acts. Okay, you've seen it before. You may may not remember it because it was probably in high school or middle school. Colin, did you use this at all or something similar? Yep. Okay. What we do in the three act structure is in the first act we hook the reader. We put the hero on the page and we get some stakes in there. What's going to happen if he doesn't take this journey? Okay. Is he going to lose his wife? Is he going to die? Is the world going to come to an end? Right. Um, for James Bond, you know, is the world going to come to an end? Um, then in the middle is all the fight. It's all the struggles the character has to go through to win, to get what he wants or to save the world. And they get worse and worse and worse and worse. So new authors have a tendency expands the amount of surface area. New authors have a tendency to to make it really really difficult way down here, and then they run out of steam up here. Okay, um, so that's why it's called the muddy middle. It's very hard to write the middle. And then the last thing that has to happen is the plan. How are we going to win the world? Then the big boom scene where we win the world, and then the last scene where we know what the new world looks like. Three act structure. Everything is that way. All right. I'm going to give it to you for the Great British Baking Show. They walk into a tent. They're, we have our heroes. We know what's at stake: the the trophy, okay, the, the the win, and they all want to win, right? They then move into test after test after test after test after test, okay. In one episode. So they get three tests in one episode. What you'll notice is right here in the middle is after the second test, they all, almost everyone goes, I'm going to do harder. It's going to be hard tomorrow, but I'm going to work harder. That's this right here. Then they have their showstopper, and that's the climax. And it either went well and they got what they wanted, or they didn't. Three act structure in a baking show. Okay. That's how clear the three act structure is if you watch seinfeld or big bang big bang theory there's a three act structure in every single episode okay if you watch a series like yellowstone which is one we're watching now the each episode will do a three act structure and then the whole thing has a three act structure okay as a, as a total you just have to watch for it okay this is the save the cat method. And the reason we're doing it this time is one that's new for me. It is the one screenplay writers use, almost all of them. It was developed by a screenplay writer named Blake Snyder. He's since passed. And then it was adapted for the novel, okay? And what we're gonna look for, let me see. Let's see. I think something's, no, it's not. Okay, the other one we're gonna look at with it is um, the hero's journey. It is the one used when they first started analyzing mythology. Uh, Colin, you're shaking your head. You know the hero's journey? That's exactly what I taught uh, seventh grade. That our whole curriculum was based on the hero's journey because the yep. seventh grader, uh, I taught all seventh grade boys too. So it was kind of their transition from youth to adulthood is mirrored in the story structure of this. So yes, <laughs> very it's, familiar with it. <laughs> a Harry Potter is complete hero's journey. Every single book is a hero's journey. But it's also save the cat. It's also the three act structure. Now they go together. Okay, you see this is broken into three acts: Act One, a big Act Two, and an Act Three. You'll notice this is three acts: Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Okay. What I want us to start watching for, and I'm going to give you the cues on this today. All right. See the ones in blue? Can you see all those, everybody? Yeah. Those are a single scene. In other words, when I say the catalyst, we should all be in agreement on where it was. Like, there's no argument. It's that clear, right? It's this thing in the book that we all go, oh, there it is. There, and there's no argument. The book we, ran in the, we read in the summer, this is where it fell apart. A Carol would think it was one thing, I would think it was another, and somebody else would think it was a third. It's a significant event and we should be able to identify it. That's what the blue are. They're the things that we should be able to identify when we're done or as we go, okay? 
and I'm gonna explain to you what they are. This is just kind of giving you a primer where we're going, okay? So this is save the cat. Oh, isn't that pretty? I want you to remember though, I have not studied this book. So he may or may not hit this marks, okay? Again, I've done it 17 times, so I think this is 17. So I've done it 16 times, 16 out of 16, they've hit the mark. I have no idea if this guy will. Well, let me rephrase, 15 out of 16. The, how many of you read the Dictionary of Lost Words? Okay, it did not hit the marks, okay? So there is a formula, right? And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the math. The opening image should be on page one, scene one. It is, what does our character's world look like right now? It's also called the ordinary world. It is right now. We don't want to know what happened to the character when he was 10 years old if he's 40 right now. Okay, that's backstory. You can't, you don't give backstory until we care about the character enough to care what happened to him in the back. Okay, so scene one is opening image. It should happen immediately. The theme stated should happen no later than page 33. And usually it's stated by someone other than the protagonist. Because remember, the protagonist has to learn. It. So the theme stated needs to be in the first 10%. And we need to know what we, we, the reader, should be able to identify it, even if our character cannot. Okay. Um, why does the first chapter have to be so good now? You know? Why is the first chapter so important, more so now than 50 years ago? You might know. Colin. I think it's the other entertainment distractions people have. If you don't grab them uh, quickly, you're going to lose them because they'll go off to some other quicker entertainment that they can okay. find. All right, Ron. You have a different answer? Uh, I, I echo that. I think it's an attention span problem. And uh, I think that I read somewhere that people start books and most of them never get past first several chapters. So yeah, unless it's compelling in the first part there, they probably won't follow up. So you're both right. And I'm gonna make it more technical. I'm gonna bring in the engineering. On Kindle, you get the first chapter free. If you don't suck them in on the first chapter, they're returning the book. So Kindle eBooks, but I'm going to use Kindle, really changed the market from a marketing perspective. Because you know what? You can write a big piece of crap today and it'll be on Kindle tomorrow if you want to put it out there for free. Really has changed the market. Um, and that one chapter, getting that one chapter free is critical for the uh, author to understand it. For example, Pride and Prejudice, his first chapter is rough. That would really kill it in today's market, okay? Um, so I just wanted you guys to know that. So while these things being in the right spot, the, you've got to show the writing really good, really well hmm, in the first chapter. I read the first two pages and I will tell you I was pulled in, okay? We'll see if you are. Then we're going to have the ordinary world that needs to be finished by page 36. Ordinary world means we by the page 36, we know who our character is. We know kind of what they do for a living. We know where we are. Why are we in New York City? Are we in, you know, what um, medieval Scotland? Like, right? where are we? We have it. We have an idea of the pace of the book. We have an idea of what how the writer writes. Um, we, we are set. We know where we're going. Like we, we have a sense of where we're going. If there's a murder, if it's a crime novel, we should have already had the crime happen, um, or at least the hints of one. By page 66, we have the catalyst, all right? And the catalyst is what happens to make the character have to go on a journey, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that next week because we don't hit it this week, but I wanted to mention it. It's also called the call to adventure. 
It's also called the inciting incident. It's that thing that happens to the character where the character has to step into the journey. Okay, there's it's a doorway of no return. Um, in the Jody Picoult book, it, it comes up pretty quick. For example, um, well, I don't want to give a Jody Picoult example. I'll give you another example. On, well, no, Wizard of Oz, call the call to adventure. She wakes up in Oz, right? She wakes up in Oz. It's that simple, okay? Um, then on pages 36 to 66, somewhere in there, as soon as she, he has the call to adventure, there's this refusal period. It's this, I don't want to go. Please don't make me do this. You know, Dorothy was like, I want to go home. So first thing out of her mouth, I want to go home. It's this, I don't want to do this. It can be really subtle and it can be really um, overt, depending on the story. But it's this moment of hesitation. It's this moment of going, can I just stay in what I'm comfortable with or do I have to go on the journey? Well, they have to go on the journey, okay? They, they're gonna try to refuse it, but they can't. So know that they're not gonna be able to. If they can refuse it, the book sucks and the author has to start over. Um, that brings us into the break into act two. Okay, which happens to the 20, 25% mark, meaning they step into the new world. So once Dorothy steps on the yellow brick road, she's now crossed the threshold and she is on her journey. Okay, once Harry Potter stepped onto the train, literally, he was on his journey. Okay, um, and I'll try to come up with more examples as we go. Um, for Scarlett O'Hara, once she found out Melanie and Ashley were getting married, she starts on her journey. Now that just that, that catalysts her to move somewhere else. And then we'll talk about something else in a minute. Okay. Then we have, I don't know why seven's missing. This is number seven, the fun and games. And that's the 25% mark to the middle. So 82 to 163. Then on page 163, on page 163, we have a midpoint. All right. And I'm going to go into, this is my favorite part of the book. So I'll go into it much more deeply when we get close. But it's this point in the book or point in the story where the, the main character basically says this, I've been getting beat up. Now I'm going to rise and put up my own fists. Okay. Basically, it's this, I'm going to quit being reactive and start being proactive. Okay. In uh, Moscow, in German Moscow, it's when he's literally standing at the mirror and he realizes he can be a good dad to this girl. It's just, she's no longer a charge. She's now daughter. That's, that was his mirror moment. You will find in 90% of the books and movies, there's a reflective surface when this happens. Mirror, um, elevator doors, um, spoons, puddles of water. So we'll be watching for those. In Sicario, the second Sicario, he, he's, he's supposed to kill this girl. He's been told he's gonna kill this girl, 12 year old, and he's shaving. And you're, he's in the mirror and you see his eyes change and the girl walks in and you can see him immediately. He, he had his mirror moment. That is not who I am. I am a lot of bad things, but I am not that. And then he goes to save the girl. So it's really clear in Hell or High Water, which is a movie I highly recommend, he makes it looking in the rearview mirror. And it's very, very clear. He had been against his brother on this um, robbing banks thing. Um, and he was doing it, but he didn't think it was all right. And he looks in the mirror and he sees what happens to his brother and he changes. And he starts actively agreeing. Ron, you've got your hand up? No, okay. All right, then we have the second part of Act Two, which means things are getting worse and worse and worse. On page 245, we should have this, this belief that the character thinks all is lost. All is lost. He's never gonna win, he's gonna lose everything. Um, and then they have a dark night of the soul, which is coming to terms with the fact that all is lost and, and kind of re-resolving themselves that if I fight harder, I don't have to lose it all. Okay, then we move into Act Three, 
another one that's very clear. Uh, then we have our finale, which is the climax. We all know what the climax is. It should happen between 80 and 90, it's supposed to be 90 and 95%. Um, and then the final image. And it's, it's the proof that the lessons were learned. So in Hero's journey vernacular, the ordinary world and the new world. So we have ordinary world, adventure world, new world. The new world is the ordinary world changed because the character has changed. Does that make sense? I promise it'll make sense as we go and read it. I know this is a lot um, and we're gonna pull it apart, but it's important for me for you guys to know kind of where we're going. Okay, this is what we're gonna see this week. The way the pages were um, divvied up was I took the number of weeks, and divided it into the page number, cut the book into pieces. Um, we will see our opening image. We should have a theme stated, so start watching for that. Um, it's usually pretty clear when you know what to look for. So we're looking for that theme the character needs to learn, okay? And then we should have a feel of what the ordinary world looks like. Where are we as the reader? Where is the character on an internal level? What are they struggling with personally? Um, so we're gonna have the plot world, which is what we step into. And then we're gonna have the character world, which is how they navigate it on an internal level. So we should see some um, understanding of a more deep level of who these characters are, okay? We learn Elizabeth Bennett in the very early pages um, is in a, family, a tight family situation. If she doesn't do, they could lose everything. So she, we, we get right away that she's got this weight on her. Um, and same with Darcy. He has a different kind of weight on him. Okay, so that's what we're going to see this week. All right. We're supposed to be hooked. Meaning, when you come back next week, you want to keep reading. All right. And the hook is simply a question that their reader wants answered. That's all it is. Who stole the statue? Who killed the family? What happened to the Burgess boys, if you read that? It starts off with this kind of, like, you're wondering what happened. Um, why does she not believe she's so special? Okay, that's a different book. Who's dead? Who killed them? Why? And so that's the hook. Um, the first line, which is, we'll look at your own personal first lines that week, can be really powerful. The first line can be the hook, all right? Um, here's one. When he woke in the woods in the dark and the cold of the night, he reached out to touch the child sleeping beside him. So these are some questions. Why is he sleeping in the woods in the dark and the cold? How long has this been happening? Who is this child? Okay, those are questions that come up from that one first sentence. I've watched through his eyes. I've listened through his ears and I can tell you he's the one. That's the first sentence of Ender's Game. Who is I and how does he watch and listen through someone else's eyes? Those are questions. I am doomed to remember a boy with a wrecked voice, not because of his voice or because he was the smallest person I ever knew or even because he was the instrument of my mother's death, but because he is the reason I believe in God I am a Christian because of Owen Newman. A lot of stuff packed in. How did he kill his mother? Why is he so small? Why is his voice struck? How did he forgive him if he killed his mother? All those questions in one sentence. Before the lost word, there was another. How do you lose a word? That's the first part. How do you lose a word? I don't know. Okay. Here's our first paragraph. Barry Sutton pulls over into the fire lane at the main entrance of the Poe building, an art deco tower glowering white, glowering white in the illumination of the exterior sconces. He climbs out of his crown vic, rushes across the sidewalk and pushes through the revolving door in the ladder. That is the first paragraph. So questions I came up with, what's the rush? What happens that requires this face? Who is Barry Sutton? Why is he stepping into that? And where is the Poe building? So where are we, okay? That's the job of the first page or two, is to get you asking questions that you wanna know the answer to. That's the trick the author uses. 
constantly keeping you in a state of wanting an answer. Because as human beings, we want the answer. And we don't like not knowing, right? We all want to know when COVID is going to end. We want an answer, right? Um, that's human nature. And so it's the author's job is to tick into that. Really, um, people like David Baldacci, if you pull up one of his books and read the last line of each chapter, you have to read the next chapter. I mean, I'm not sure he doesn't write that last line first because, man, you are stuck. Um, and that's the author's trick is to constantly think, what can I weave in here that's going to make the reader question something? Okay. Uh, I'm going to run through this because this is stuff we're going to see this week. The very first pages of the book are the contract with the reader. Contract is very important, okay? It cannot be violated. That means, how does this author write, right? Are we gonna, are we gonna get like um, in um, Jim in Moscow, this beautiful lyrical writing? Or are we gonna get um, David Badachi, this much faster paced, um, not great lyrical writing? Um, what are we gonna get? What kind of mood is this book? Is this a dark book or a light book, right? Is this a book I'm gonna have to make time and cuddle up and sink into depression to read? Or is it gonna be one that's gonna make me laugh, okay? That is the author's contract and it cannot be violated. The other thing they need to do here is we need to know whose point of view we're walking through the book in. Who are we in this book? Now, Colin likes more than one, I do too but you have to be careful how many, okay? Because it's hard to capture, but we need to know that. That's the contract. And if the contract is violated later, the reader's very upset. Let me give you an example. If you're reading a book that's very lyrical, lots of scenery and in, you know, deep internal struggles, and all of a sudden in the middle of the book, it becomes a comedy, they've broken the contract because you didn't agree at the beginning to read a comedy. How you got fooled. So that's the contract. Um, tone is the atmosphere the author is trying to give us. If you read Silence of the Lamb, it's a dark tone. The, the scenery's dark. Um, everything is dark. Okay. Um, mood is what you feel. Right? So I present a tone on the paper that you bring your own crap to the novel. All right, I'll give you an example. Beekeeper of Aleppo. I was supposed to read it from my book club. The story is clearly by the first chapter going to be depressing and hard. That's the tone. I bring to that book, my brother lives with me and he's dying with brain cancer. I bring that to the mood of this book. I couldn't read it, okay, because of that. I brought me, and it changed the mood of the book, okay? That's mood, all right. We should get a sense of voice and pace. Is this going to be one of these kind of books, or is it going to be like Amar Tolls, kind of a nice, slow, you know, that gentleman in Moscow was slow. Now I'm here in Lincoln Highway. It's a faster pace. Um, whose voice are we going to be in? Are we going to get long, beautiful sentences? Or are we going to get short, curt sentences? Are we going to have big vocabulary where we have to get out of the dictionary? Or are we going to get nothing more than two syllable words? Okay. Um, marketing note. This is again thinking of marketing. The back, the cover and the back flap must match the tone. Okay, they have to match. So if you haven't read the back, be sure you do because it really gives you the tone of this book, okay? And this needs to be in here. You can usually tell when somebody wrote the back flap that wasn't the author, okay? Because it's not quite the same voice. I'm not gonna go through these. Well, yeah, I will. we got a little bit of time. Yeah. So real quick, the name of the book is The Butterfly Garden. What are you expecting? Somebody tell me one thing you're expecting with a book named The Butterfly Garden. Come 
Come on. Do you expect it to be light and flowery? Yeah. No, Debbie says no. What are you expecting, Debbie? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. She's still muted. Light, flowery, oh, pretty flower, yeah. what you, plants. What do you think, Debbie? I, I, from books I've read, that's sort of misleading. It's sort of like something happens out there that is, that something yep. emotional or dark is going to happy out, happen out there. It's not going to be light and airy. Light, light and airy. No, that, Let that's. Let me show you the cover. <laughs> The cover is exactly that. It is obviously not light and airy, right? So juxtaposition, right there we're asking questions. Why is this book named Butterfly Garden and yet so dark, right? There's immediately a question. Like, what is this? And I'm not gonna read the back cover because we don't have time, but I'm gonna send you these notes. Be sure you read the back cover because the back cover is chilling and the book is chilling. The back cover and the book match, right? Um, but in the contract, let's just go back to the contract. If you bought this book, having seen this cover and read this, and all of a sudden at about page 30, it turns into a romantic comedy, you're going to be pissed. <laughs> you, the author will have violated the contract, and you're going to throw the book against the wall, and then go into a really bad review, okay? All right. I'm going to come back to some of this later, I promise. Uh, we need to get the protagonist. I know I'm, I'm just seeing what else I definitely want us to get to. Characteristic moment. I want us to get to this. This is the first time we see the character. As soon as we see the character, we should get, we should get a sense of name, gender, that kind of thing, sense of that. Um, we should know any important characteristics that are physical. We should not get... Yeah, but everything. Only things that are important. So if you're going to put a character on the face with a huge scar, well, that we might want, need to know. And is that's important. We need to know their role in the story. Okay? Like, who are they going to be? What's, what's their job? Um, we need to know kind of about his personality. We want to hook the reader to sympathy or empathy for the character. If we don't bond with the character in that first few pages, in that first time we see him, it's really hard to stay on the train when we've got hundreds of books behind us that we can pick up, okay? Really important. Um, we should have an indication of what's going on, you know, some, some sort of hint of what's going on. We don't have to know everything, but we do need to get a sense of, you know, what's gonna be happening. We, we need to get a sense of the journey. Um, we need to demonstrate or hint at his lie. I'm not going to go over lie, that'll be its own class. Um, but just to give you a hint, it's that thing he believes about himself that is not true. It's that thing he believes about himself that is not true. And we all have them. We all have them. And we pick up new ones. We get rid of one and we pick up a new one. Um, how this, we need to be getting some foreshadowing. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? That we need to see the character in action. We don't want to start a book where the character's sitting on his recliner contemplating his navel. Okay? That does not work for us. Theme stated. I already told you what it was. All right. Um, it's, used, it's frequently stated to the protagonist okay? by another character. Um, we should be able to point to it on the page in writing. When I teach writing and we're you know, kind of working these earlier chapters, I make them point it out. I make them highlight it. If you can't find it, neither can the reader. If you can't find it, then you know what you're writing about. Okay. Harry Potter's is uh, real early. Um, he's been adopted and raised by these terrible people. It's you have value. His theme is you have value, even though you've been, even though your lie is you don't. Okay, so Harry Potter's a really good one. Because of the way he's been raised, he is valueless on his interior world. He's told in the very early pages he has value. You have value. You are important. Okay. Um, 
for the reader, it may or may not be obvious. And there can be more than one, but there is a keen theme. There is one the author is trying to drive home. Other ones you pick up might be some of the baggage you're bringing to the book, positive baggage and negative baggage, okay? So if you're gonna read a Jody Picoult book, the one about abortion, you're bringing your own history to that topic, your own belief system to that topic. You might find other themes in the book beyond the one she wanted. Okay, um, and we're going to talk about the lot later. Okay, we can keep going, but I'm supposed to stop. See, remember that we I plan too much thing. I thought we went to eleven thirty, <laughs> so there's strike one. Um, so, how many of you can stay for a little bit longer? All right, let me ask it this way: How many of you cannot? stay. I know somebody has to leave to go to a class. You, Sheree, can't stay. Are you okay, Sheree, if we keep going a little bit? Because you've taken the class before. No problem. That's great. Okay. She's taken the class before. So here's what I want to do. I want to give us like a three-minute um, refill our coffee break, go to the bathroom break, and we'll come back and I'll get through this as fast as I can. Does that sound good? Angel, good morning. How are you? We are in a break, in a coffee break. Oh, okay. Is it good? I hope they were not Mr. Borja. That is you. <laughs> How is that expression that we say she, he or she can take this? Piece of uh, the um, panettone. Uh, oh no, it's too late. It's too late. It's eleven. Okay. Augustito came and he needed to feed his family. So and, uh, he got all kind of jobs. They, uh, he worked. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, that's all. That's all. Nothing else. It's the same thing that the uh, folding the cartons all day long. <laughs> okay, I'm going back to my.
um, June. Did you say Thank you're you. saying? Yeah, this is Linda. Did you say that you're going to be sending these um, overheads to us? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Fantastic. So is over. Um, now, apparently, when I post things to the Emory and upload them, some people are having a hard time getting the uploads. If that happens, just send me an email and I'll send it directly to your email. Okay. Okay. I know that happened with um, two people on the reading schedule. So just shoot me an email and say it didn't come through and I'll pop it over to you. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, good. All right. And I have read this book. Oh. But I can't remember much of it, but I liked it. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I've only read the first 10 pages just to make sure I didn't get another disaster like the ugly, wonderful things. Uh, no. So this basically, is, this go ahead, Linda. Yeah, I, I wound up, I think, reading several of his books after oh, that. Good. That but makes sense. Again, they're not that, you know, I don't remember every detail at all, just the feeling of it. Good. So what I did, just so you guys know what how this worked, I ran the opening images, trusting the contract. So I read the opening image so that I could feel confident of what I was giving to you guys. If he violates that, I'm gonna be ticked off, right? Um, so just so you know. Um, I wanted to go back to opening images because I forgot a couple things. Um, we should, we should, it's, in, it's called in media rest, and I know Colin's gonna shake his head, and he knows what that is. Um, meaning we're starting in the middle of the action. Again, we're not starting with him sitting on his couch thinking about acting, okay? We, we want to join a story where we feel like it's already in play, okay? Um, where we are jumping in on the journey, okay? Um, that's the reader wants to feel that way. We're looking to identify with the character. In what way do I emphasize, sympathize, empathize, sympathize, or see myself in this situation, okay? Okay. Um, I do want to point out two things that are confusing. There's the inciting incident and the key incident. You always have an inciting incident. It's what happens in the story to force your character on the journey. You might have a key incident. A key incident is outside the story. But if it hadn't happened, this story could not exist. If World War II had not happened, none of those books would exist that are about World War II. So World War II is the key incident. It's not the inciting incident. The inciting incident is what happens to the character in the frame of the novel. In um, Tolls, Gentleman in Moscow, the key incident, the incident outside the story is the Russian Revolution. If that hadn't happened, this whole story has nothing to stand on. So that's the key incident. If there is one, we should be able to figure that out, right, immediately. So when you open a World War II book, you know the key incident was Hitler declares war in Poland, right? Okay? So that's the key incident. It's just a piece of terminology I thought you might like to know. And then the inciting incident is in the novel world. The key incident is out here. The story of Anne Boleyn. You couldn't write that story without Henry VIII and the whole uh, monarchy of that time period. Outlander. You couldn't write Outlander if they didn't have um, the Jacobot rising. The story wouldn't work. You'd have to find a different plot. Okay. So just wanted you to think about that. Um, if we're going to be in a time travel novel, that's got to come out quick because you've got to set the stage for that. We've got to know that. You can't have a novel and then on page 50, turn it into a time travel novel. That doesn't work, that you violated your contract. So the contract is really important in these first pages. Okay. We talked about this already. I just wanted to go back to that because I missed it somehow. All right. So the three act structures is exactly this. Your character moves in one world. Something forces them into an adventure world. 
once they learn all their beautiful lessons, they get to come back to their ordinary world, but it's new because they're new people. I'm going to give you Wizard of Oz. Very beginning of Wizard of Oz, which is what we learned. Dorothy's adopted. She lives with her aunt and uncle. She feels like no one likes, like she, she doesn't, no one, she's not important is how she feels. And we get that because no, no one has time for her. And that's very clear. All the aunt and all three of the workers say, we don't have time for you. Okay. So that's her ordinary world. That's her lie that people don't have time for her. She's not important. That's her lie. Okay. And then something happens. The, uh, tornado and she wakes up in Oz, now we're in the adventure world. She learns her lesson about being valuable in that she saves the Tin Man and she saves all of them and herself. Then she gets to go home. And when she goes home, she's a completely different person. She now understands they do love her. They were just busy with life. It wasn't her. It was circumstance. That's the hero's journey. And that's the journey we're following. So the setup for us in this early reading is what is our ordinary world? Who are they? What do they think about themselves? And where are they standing? Okay, so that's what's happening. In this. And you bond with Dorothy right away, right? We've all had that feeling of not being for it. Um, in this setup, we get to know the hero better, as I've said. But we also prove the character needs to go on a journey. We're, it's proven to us there's something that that character needs to understand about himself or about life. We understand that as readers. Okay. Um, so we know that he needs to change. And because we already care about the reader, we want him to go on this journey. And because we care about him and like him or don't like him, we find him intriguing, then we want to go on the journey with him. Okay, so that's stuff. What we don't get is back as paragraphs of backstory. We don't get info dumping. Okay, an info dump is you don't know about wine, so I'm going to give you two pages of wine wine education, and I'm going to pop it in here in some long piece of dialogue. The reader's going to figure that out. We don't info dump. Okay, you have to figure out how to give that information. Um, at the right time and in little pieces that the character, the reader really has to know. In a, a book I read by somebody, we're going along and, and the, it's one of those murder mystery things and the character ends up in a robotic, robotics factory and the bad guy is the robot or actually the person controlling the robot but in the scene, it's the robot. Think Terminator. And the, and the author stops the, the action to give us two pages on how robotics works. You can't do that. I mean, I, I did finish the book because I really don't finish a book, but it was very, very frustrating because you stopped me to teach me. You gotta teach me a different way. That's called info dumping. We only get what we need to know right now in this scene, okay? And it won't be backstory. Now, there is a difference between backstory and flashback. Backstory is, I'm going to tell you something that happened in my history. Flashback is something triggers me. I step back and relive another, something that happened in the past. So one is you're being told, that's backstory. The other is flashback and you are reliving it with the character. Okay. Um, so I'll let you know if we have flashbacks. I don't know. No idea. But we'll talk about them more and more as we go in the back. I talked to you about the questions being asked, all right? I want you to pay attention to that. Um, hopefully the book is good and so good that you don't want to stop and pay attention, but try to slow down and, and go, okay, wait, oh, that was interesting. That was interesting. I know before the end of the first scene, he says, some, the, somebody says, I have FAS. Well, and there's a, I put a note, what, the, what is that? Right now I'm intrigued. You, you put something on the page, that even if your writing is not great, I want to keep going. Okay. Um, 
should be a lot of questions. We get answers to them and new ones pop up. And then there's always the bigger ones that don't get answered. Um, I want you to try to notice when you're intrigued. Just try to notice what is pulling you in, okay? Where do you get an emotional tap? It's no longer words on a page, it's an experience you're having. Harry Potter, Colin, I know you read Harry Potter. Yeah. Did you like Harry Potter? I love Harry Potter, yeah. Okay. Did you like Harry? Uh, yeah, for the most part, I thought, uh, yeah, he was intrigued. He was relatable. He wasn't, you know, a jerk. Did you feel sorry for him? Did you feel sorry for him sometimes? Yes, definitely. Did you want uh, the bad guys? And I didn't. I only read one Harry Potter. Um, did you want the bad guys to get it? Like, didn't yes. to work right. You wanted them to get it, right? They deserve to get it. That's yes. emotional yes. attachment in your novel. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what we're looking for. I never got it with Harry Potter, but interestingly, I got it with Twilight. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I read Twilight because I taught a bunch of high schoolers. What were they reading? They were reading Twilight. Um, and I had an identification with Edward and Bella. I was, but I'm 50 years old. Good enough writing. Yes, Judy, you have your hand up. Well, good. I just wanted to make sure I went in and updated my app. But I, so I, you can see my hand raised. Yeah. Um, I also have another question, but I'm not sure this is the best place for it. But if I ask it, we can even, you can even let me know. I'm reading a book right now that has, I feel it has three very diverse plot lines. Oh, what book is it? Let's start there. Um, it's the new door book, Cloudland, Cloud, Cloud Cuckoo Land. Yeah. I know they're, they're, I'm almost to the end. I know they come together, but in the context of first, second, and third act. So should I read that as in each individual storyline or as it applies to the whole book? Okay, so I'm gonna use all the light we cannot see to answer that. Is that okay? Because I know all the light we cannot see, all right? So yeah. I'm, Judy, you read that, right? I lost her somehow. I don't know if she can hear me or not. So how many of you read all the light you cannot see? Okay, if you haven't, highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. I um, mean, I don't recommend books terribly often because I know I like, like I like Twilight. <laughs> that makes me weird. Um, so in Anthony Doerr's All That You Cannot See, we've got, I think his name was Frederick? No, I started with a W. And then we had Marie. So we had the French girl and the German boy. We had both their stories going at the same time and they did not cross until the very end. Okay, so we had two distinct stories. Each story, if you pulled them out and calculated their page numbers, should have landed on all these marks, okay? So what I did was when I taught it, I pulled out Weiner, Warner, Warner's story, and I recalculated based on where his pages were, his story pages, and it lined up perfectly and so did hers. If you pull back on the whole story, it lines up, um, and what's happening to them is happening at about the same time. So it did line up as the whole story it was just a little harder to pin down. So Judy, I don't know, because I don't know if we have three completely distinct separate and they don't cross paths. If that's what we have, then you should have three completely separate arcs. Um, but at some point or another, they should, you know, like a, they should pull together. Do you think they're gonna pull together or do you have- three Yeah, separate? Okay. yeah they are um but the, uh, compared to all the light we cannot see the construction i feel that the construction of this novel is just different because the timelines don't historic the historic like one is set in the medieval period and the other one is set in the future and so it's been kind of interesting with them going back and forth. So I'm, I'll probably have to reread it. One of the things I find sad for authors, Anthony Doerr, Amor Tolls, is when they put out something so great, we expect that the next time. Um, yeah, and, that, and that I have the cuckoo one on the shelf and I haven't picked it up. Same with the Amor Tolls one, because I'm worried about that. I don't want to discover 
And I'm going to go in expecting, although we cannot see quality, and I'm going to go in expecting Jimmy to Moscow quality, and I'm worried I'm not going to get it. So I just kind of keep bypassing them on my show. Maybe I'll do in the next class when I teach it in the spring, do Lincoln Highway. Um, anyway. So I do want you to notice when you get some sort of level of emotional, mm, okay, try to notice. It can be subtle. It can be um, really noticeable, but try to notice and see if you can um, figure out when that's happening for you. If it doesn't happen in this reading, then this, you, this something, we're going to have to fix something because <laughs> it should happen quick. Okay. Wayne, do you have your hand up or is it just still up? It's up. Okay. Um, uh, and this is an aside, and you can choose to do whatever you want with this, but I'm sitting here thinking about Moby Dick, okay. which is a book I read a million years ago. I actually had a high school English teacher who tried to teach it, which was, um, that was very ambitious. Yeah, I, uh, I've never read it. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's widely considered the greatest American novel ever. But you talk about info dump. Yeah. I mean, he goes into excruciating detail about the whaling industry and all of the technical side of it. And, you know, it's it's kind of overwhelming and it's very difficult to get through. But I was just I just had to mention it because, you know, you kind of touched on that concept as being something that doesn't really work. Right. And the word and excruciating is, is very telling there, right? It and is, but yet the novel is incredible. I mean, it is a piece. It's a ma it's a masterpiece. Oh, I will There's never know. No <laughs> okay. You know, one of the reasons the info dump is really hard now, as opposed to in much earlier writings, is we have such access to information now that there's not much out there we can't access Twitter, Instagram, the internet. So there's not as much right. need for it. And, there's, and back to the, we don't have patience anymore because there's so much distraction. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have patience for info dumps either. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things like setting, unless it's a really unique setting, you can't spend much time on it because everybody knows what New York looks like, right? You don't need to describe New York anymore. Whereas a hundred years ago, most people hadn't seen New York. You had to describe it. So that's a big change in novel writing now. Because if somebody brings up, I read a book recently that had some Goa India in it. And I just went and looked at what Goa was. Okay. I went and took some pictures and they didn't waste time on describing it knowing I could go do that. So Colin, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was going to say kind of in defense of Moby Dick, the, the structure of that novel is you get a whaling chapter that's more of a historical description of whaling and then you go to the novel and so like within the story itself there's not really that info dump and if you kind of figure out that pattern early on you can just skip the inner chapters ah. and just read it and then the story is much better and you don't have the info dump and the the same as uh grapes of wrath by steinbeck he did a lot of that about machinery and the farm machinery and so forth but at least he's doing it in intermittent chapters so you once you figure out the structure, you can skip, skip them if you don't want the historical context. I did a whole year of Steinbeck. And the last year I had my school, we did a whole year of Steinbeck. And I thought those kids were going to kill me when they got to how Grapes of Back ended with the old yeah. man and the breastfeeding. They were just like. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a really interesting <laughs> view of Grapes of Wrath now. Mm -hmm. um, well, but, no, can you explain that? I, I don't know what you mean. What, what was yeah. their problem with that? It was just so, you remember how it ended where the old man is breastfeeding off? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredibly disgusting. poignant. Yeah. But not when you're a high schooler. They were just <laughs> disgusted by the whole idea. That's pathetic. Um, that That's that's just, that's absolutely pathetic. It was that, just gross to them. So. Yeah, well, yeah, that's too uh, that's too bad. Yeah. I was going to really say, it's, uh, it, it, it's shocking to me that having taught middle school for years, you never got a parent complained or a kid complained about any violence in anything that we read, but you have two characters kiss and it was like the end of the world. It, it, it was very interesting <laughs> mindset. So they... Well, I'm going to tell you a story about that. Does anybody know who Leanne Moriarty is? Mor Moriarty. She wrote Big Little Lies, which is a big book. She wrote, um, anyway, she's written a lot. Um, most of it's really, really good. 
she, I saw her speak and she said, somebody asked her, what's the difference in the audiences? You know, the American audience, the Australian audience in the UK. She said, Australia, she said, I'm Australian. They don't think I'm anything special. So they don't really care about what I have to say. She said in the UK, they, um, they, they are a very quiet group. They don't, she said, but you get here. And what I've noticed is I can kill anybody in any novel and nobody cares. Nobody cares. I give one ounce of adultery and I get letter after letter after letter after letter about how awful that was. So, I, it's, so to your point, we don't mind violence. There's other things we don't want our children to see. So it's interesting. So Ron, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Uh, circling back to Moby Dick for a moment <laughs> and your request about Please send your mm -hmm. favorite first lines. Does anybody uh -huh. remember it? Call me, Call me Ishmael. Ishmael. Yeah. Yep. Can you get anything out of that? Well, I mean, don't you immediately go, who's Ishmael? I, I did, And, and yes. that was hard to analyze from a first line perspective because it is so well known um, that it's kind of lost its, in, you know, in an analysis, everybody knows it. Um, I did a red Moby Dick, and I have to say it will not make my list. I did read Anna Karenina and I've read some of that stuff, but Moby Dick never made cross my path. Um, June, you, June, you should reconsider that position. Just, <laughs> just my opinion. Okay, I'll reconsider it. It's, for a it's, or two. <laughs> it's, you know, between that and Huck Finn and, you know. And those I've read, I even read um, in King Arthur's Court or Connecticut Yankee, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. So I've read most of Twain. Mm -hmm. Has okay. anybody read the long, the long road down? No, the long way down. Colin, you need to read it. Um, it's. I will bring it next week and show it to you. You can read it in two hours. It is prose. Uh, no, it's verse. Most written in verse, not in prose. And it's a full novel in verse, and it is one of the most powerful things I've ever read. And it's by Jason Reynolds. Um, yeah, I've, I've read people. lots of other Jason Reynolds stuff. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. right. Because some of it's required by Atlanta Public Schools, mm -hmm. All American Boys, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, I highly recommend it. It's one of the most powerful yeah. books I've ever read, and you can read it in two hours because okay. um, it's for a younger age group, but it's really powerful. Um, and you get contract theme character in the first verse, the first poem. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, and you're you're asking questions all the way. It's really well done structure, um, and it's just very it's just so creatively done. It's he's a master, um, truly. Um, I did that already. Now I promise you. This is not me lecturing starting next week. Next week, it'll be, let's talk about what we did see, what we didn't see, what was working, what wasn't working. And then I'll give you what we're supposed to see the next time. Um, and then I'll also tease out anything unique like the epizuxis or the polysyndetin or the asyndetins, or um, eventually we're gonna study a scene and see there's certain things a scene must do. And is it doing it? Um, we'll look at the dialogue and what's working with the dialogue versus what isn't. Um, so this week happened to be a lot of info dumping. Okay. Um, mm. But next week, it'll be less of that. Um, raise hand, Judy. Just a quick question. I'm finding that reading a book, physically reading the book and listening to a book is totally different. And that sometimes a book that I don't think I would have liked if I read it, I like it better listening to it. Uh, the Dutch House, Tom Hanks did a fabulous job reading that book. And even though it was quite good, it was even better on Audible. And then there's the other books that whether it's the reader or the content, I'm not quite sure, they just don't listen well. Yeah, it's probably both. Um, but the audible markets, thinking of markets, is one of the fastest growing markets. It's very expensive for a new time author to get into. Um, it runs about five grand to get, well, 2,500 to get somebody you like. 
and then there's profit sharing there and you're not making any profit anyway. So, um, uh, but to your point, speaking of marketing, there's a narrator that I like so much. I will listen to any book he's read, even if it's way out of my genre, just because he's read it. Um, I find mysteries the easiest to listen to because there's not such depth of character, right? Um, so I can turn it on and off and not really get engaged with thinking about it too much. Um, but audible books are hugely popular. If you aren't doing it, you ought to try one. Um, now, I didn't listen to the Tom Hanks book because I don't like Ann Patchett. But I want to listen to it because I like Tom Hanks and just hasn't made the top of my list. So how many of you do Audible or audiobooks? I used to. Did I you used not to like road them? trips. What, Debbie? I used to do listen when I was on a road trip somewhere and it was, it, and I'm sitting here trying to think of the name of the one and I'm so embarrassed. It's an expression, it's from the war, the, um, oh, it's embarrassing. It's a small story and it's an expression we all use to, um, and, and I wanted to learn about what the expression was, wh where it came from and what it meant. And I can't believe I'm blanking but on what it is, but um, it was just like, oh, I get it. You know, that was one of those that it, I would have hated reading it. It was short, but, um, and I'm gonna hate, I hate myself because I can't remember, well, I hate myself, but I hate that I can't remember it because it's, and it'll come to me in, in, as soon as we're all off there. But it's just one of those, expressions that people use to ex explain a, a right. concept or process or something. So who, who wants to give me a guess on the top um, selling the two fastest growing genres right now? Genre is like, this is science fiction. Um, uh, Colin. I, I don't know both, but I would guess uh, graphic novels is one of them. Nope. Well, nope. Let, let me, no. And I might, might not be asking the question right. Okay. How about self-help? Uh, let's stay in fiction, in the oh, fiction okay. world. Self-help is always going to be a pretty good seller. But no, uh, Ryan, were... you had a guess? How about romance? Romance is always at the top. Um, I'm looking for a little more. Um, let me give you the first one. Books Dystopian. written by and about people of color they're mm. called poc people yeah. of color diversity the fastest growing markets written by and about people of color so if you go to your local bookstore you'll see a lot of books written by um different cultures so um i just wrote one just bought one uh, anyway so what do you think the second one is what's that dystopian Maybe. No, good guess though. LGBTQ. Uh, the whole identity stuff is really running. Now they're having a real issue though, because just because you, you identify doesn't mean you're a good writer. And it's really, they're really coming out with some really bad stuff and it's starting to really hurt that market because somebody that is identifying and working that internal world of their identification and how the external world responds to them doesn't mean you can write but yet they're putting it out there those are the two fastest growing the other fastest growing is the 25 to 40 year old african-american woman really a fast growing market going back to people of color written by people of color. So those gonna to go together, obviously. But romance is the fast, is the biggest selling of all genres, has been forever and will be forever. So why almost all books have an element of romance. <laughs> almost all books, even mysteries, have an, usually have an element of romance. Very important. Another thing you know about genre, and now we're just chatting, okay? So we're just chatting, go when you go, and at about 1130, I'll go. And, but one of the other things to know interesting about genre is they have very specific rules. They have very specific, and if you violate those rules, then you are setting yourself up to get slammed in reviews. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that. I did do one slide, genre, okay. For example, romance. If you, romance 
that's not young adult romance. So young adult romance has one set of rules, adult romance has another. In an adult romance, if you don't have happily ever after, you cannot call it a romance. You cannot market it as a romance. In young adult, you have to have what they call happily for now, meaning the book ends with them together. Not necessarily forever after, because that group is not worried about forever after yet, right? But it's called hap happily for now. And if it doesn't end that way, you cannot market it as romance. Um, thriller has its own set of rules. Mystery has its own set of rules. Monster in the House has its own set of rules. We're going to go over those in another week or so. Another one of the weeks is all the different genres. And then the genres have subgenres. Okay. On Amazon, the author is allowed to choose five. You can choose five to market yourself in. Okay. And you wouldn't do romance. You would do Regency romance, African, uh, Regency romance, people of color. And so th that's how detailed you get because um, you can only pick five and there's thousands of them. We'll look at some of them. Um, so recursion is science fiction. So this is the science fiction rules. Insight to the future of the human race and the world in general. The future, it acts as a warning or a caution to us. It's food for thought for the scientific community. It's brain wrecking experiences and still leaves many questions unanswered, which will that will frustrate me, okay, as a, as a person who reads. High tech gear or science, that is absolutely critical. It's got to have some element of science. Um, not, so magical realism is different. Fantasy is different. They have different sets of rules. Um, there are utopias or dystopias usually. They are allowed extensive world building, meaning science fiction, historical, historical pieces, uh, magical realism, fantasy are allowed about 50,000 extra words for world building, world building. That's a lot. Uh, if you think of Game of Thrones, right? A lot of his book is world building. Show me where we're at because I can't go. I don't know what New York in 2020 and 2060 looks like. You're going to have to tell me. So they're allowed a lot of that. Uh, Outlander, historical. She was allowed a lot of leeway for world building because the reader who reads that kind of book expects it and is okay with it because we that's what we read. I read a lot of historical stuff. Okay, so that's genre. We'll go into more of them. There's a lot more complications to genre. But from the publishing and author marketing perspective and the writing perspective is very important because if you don't hit those marks, you cannot market it that way. Um, and you will get called out on it. The readers will call you out on it. So you start reading reviews and you see those one and two stars, jump down and see if it's because they violated the genre expectations. Um, it can really, really hose you up. Anything else we want to talk about? Everybody understand what we're doing, where we're going. Okay. Anything else? Everybody getting what they thought they were going to get so far? Yep. All right. All right. Again, I have no idea what we're going to get. I've only read the first 10 pages, and we're supposed to read to what page? 36. Yeah, 46, and you'll be able to see it. It'll be, it'll be a scene break in there. This didn't do chapters, so I couldn't do chapters. I don't know how to help people who are listening to it know where that is. I've never tried to do that with Audible, so I'm not going to be much help. Um, if you are doing it on Kindle or ebook, I gave you the last line before you stop reading. Is anybody doing the ebook version, or does everybody have a version? Are there versions? Uh, well, the paper, but there's a paperback apparently, and I have the hardback. I don't know how the pages will line up, but it doesn't matter because we're reading them in such small chunks. If I go to pull something out, I'll be able to find it for you. That won't be hard. Um, I'll compare the, I compared the first few just to see in the paperback and the hard, you know, the hard copy, what if they look the same and the pages seem to line up, but I'll do that some more while I still have the hard copy. Yeah. And again, since we're only reading in 50 page chunks and they're really small chunks when you get in and look at them, I'll be able to point it out even without the page number. 
Okay. Yeah, I have I have the ebook too because I just saw it on one of the daily specials for like two bucks. So I just picked up <laughs> yeah. that also. So I, I could check and match to see if those match up in any way. Okay. Was and they won't. And here's why, because you can change your font. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that change your true. page numbers. Yeah. But usually if you set the thing at the bottom, you can at least say oh, what page. You? Yeah, I think I'm, you can. I think you can get it to change on there. Okay. I've never done that. So yeah, I, I have a tendency to buy them on Kindle and then like them and have to order them anyway mm -hmm. because I mark all of them. So, I'll give you a funny story and then we'll call it a day. We moved recently and 17 boxes of books came in the house and another 17 went to storage and I had them box, I had them out and I had them all stacked waiting on my bookshelves to be put in. And so there was just, I think 21 stacks or something of books and I was do, doing a class and I said something like, yeah, I've got 21 stacks of books I haven't read yet. My husband heard that. <laughs> and he was like, honey, if you haven't read all these books, stop buying books. And I thought that was just sacrilege, right? And so that very day, four more books came in now. So <laughs> um, I have lots of books, but I don't have Moby Dick. <laughs> I'll have to buy Moby Dick and put it on the shelf and walk past it and go, one day I will read Moby Dick. I never read War and Peace either. No, or Dickens. So who was it in the class that did the year of Dickens? Was that you, Judy? No, it wasn't me. One of, the, <laughs> one of the ladies in one of our classes was doing the year there of Dickens. was. Dickens. Yeah, it was like the whole book club. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Remember that, yeah. And, and she was in a Actually, I think there were two women that were friends that were in the same book club, now that you mention it, that they yeah. were doing that. They did a whole year of Dick. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to teach. It, not picking a particular book, but reading, they'll pick an author and then they'll, everybody will choose a different, a different book I by the that. same author. I, I used to teach. I used to teach, uh, I taught Tale of Two Cities for a couple of years, and I did Great Expectations for a couple of years, but with the eighth grade students, and we did it uh, in addition to what we were reading in regular class, but uh, speaking about structures of novels, since they were written as serials that would come out in weekly installments in the literary magazines at the time, we would read it in weekly installments, and then every Friday would be our Tale of Two Cities Day or our Great Expectations Day. Oh, that uh, so they, they kind of got the feel of a serialized novel that and and equated to how that kind of was like a modern tv show and so because they they kept wondering how can we read two books at the same time i was like well you watch eight shows at the same time and keep track of what's going on <laughs> did anybody read the another, that's another first line of a novel that everybody knows yeah mm -hmm. cities i mean uh, yeah. yeah did anybody read or see the martian yeah, both, yeah. Do you know the story of how that got published? Oh. So he, Andy Weir, was writing this this novel, this story, really. He had no real, I don't think he had a goal for it. And he's actually sent it to some actual scientists, rocket scientists, and got feedback. So for, he was kind of having fun with it. And he kept doing that chapter after chapter, and he was sitting on chapter at a time. And some of them said, could you please just slam them together and put them out on Kindle for us? We can have the whole thing. And he literally slammed it together, put it out on Kindle. Um, and uh, the somehow the TV people found it or the movie people found it. And then Simon and Schuster picked it up. Um, so it was, it was rare. It went from not even planning to publish it for the publisher to go into the movies to go into the publisher. So that's how his was done. And I have read Hail Mary. Sorry, I have to go, but I want to confirm. You're going to post your PowerPoint on for us before next week? I'll send it'll be as soon as we hang up. Okay, awesome. Thank you. See Bye. you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 All right. Shoot me any questions, nope. any problems, and read to page whatever it was. 46, 47. I think it was 36. No, it's 47. 47, huh? Okay. The 36 is the first 10%. Those are some of the things we're supposed to see, but we're reading about 50 pages a week. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, June.
Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Oh.